thanks to uh, first of all to Cochrane for in for inviting the um, NRSI, that's the Non Randomised Studies of Interventions Working Group, to attend of, of, on whose behalf I'm, I'm presenting, um, and and thanks to so many people from around the world for for attending uh, today. Um, I'm going to talk about the types of systematic review questions um, in public health for which non-randomized studies of interventions are needed. Um, I think it, it's important to, I, I'm not really a big fan of this 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 term NRSI um, in, um, in, in the sense that I'm going to be applying it because, because non-randomized studies of interventions is, is, is rather a broad um, set of interventions. Uh, a, a broad set of study designs. Um, I'm just going to be talking about quantitative causal s studies of effects, so study studies that you would, you would use to answer effect questions. Um, of course, there are much, uh, the lots of other different types of study designs, and um, Andrew and Kate are going to be talking about. Um, um, the, are going to start talking about that afterwards. Um, so I'm going to be giving some examples of. Um, rigorous designs that can be used in, in public health. Um, and I'm going to talk about issues faced in incorporating these types of studies um, and what do we find um, when we um, do critical appraisal. Um, I've just moved my slides forward. Um, so this is, um, I, I found out, as, as, as Jay said, I've uh, uh, recently joined as a co-convener. We do have a web presence um, and the other uh, conveners of the group um, are listed on this page here. They, they've all um, contributed um, in, inputs into my presentation. Okay, so let's start with um, a good review starts, as as Eva said, um, thinking about the types of questions and making sure that our, that our questions are, are, are set up cl clearly. Okay, so um, what, what types of questions do we have in, in on public health reviews in which non-randomized studies are needed? Um, first of all, when we're measuring um, impacts where randomised trials are not feasible. So Eva talked about cases where we have population level interventions. They, they might be universally applied, so there's no uh, non-intervention control groups. Um, there might be situations where it is difficult to conduct RCTs ethically, perhaps because of some of the outcomes that have been measured, like mortality, for example. Um, there, there may be cases um, where we're trying to measure impacts in population subgroups, um, where we would have weak statistical power, so it's very difficult to design a, a prospective study, randomised or otherwise, um, um, and we, you know, we would usually associate that with with rare outcomes um, or perhaps for um, um, conditions amongst um, population subgroups. When when we're measuring harms, um, there's some evidence that suggests that. Um, for harms and more generally unintended consequences um, that the measuring effects uh, does not require uh, is uh, does not require randomized um, evidence and it also ob obviously there would be issues with um, ethical problems with that um, as my colleague from uh, Campbell collaboration Vivian Welch has argued in her recent review on uh, deworming interventions uh, measuring long-term impacts uh, for which preventing contamination of controls requires non-randomized evidence. And then finally, um, if we're interested in evaluating exposures or, or perhaps pre-existing interventions, and I'll come on to talk about exposures and how they're different from interventions a bit later. Um, I, more generally, I think it's worth pointing out that um, in, in public health, randomized trials uh, are fundamentally different to those in, in on clinical topics, um, particularly in the approaches that, that we can incorporate to address bias. So, so there is a much more level playing field when we're talking about public health um, interventions. And, and I would, of, of the, the reviews I've seen, uh, the reviews I've worked on, I would ex actually expect um, public health reviews to incorporate both RCTs and non-randomized studies of interventions, of, of interventions when, when assessing the effects. Okay, so there is actually a very long tradition of, I'm sure most, uh, many of you will be aware of non-randomized studies of interventions in, in public health. Um, so the most famous and, and indeed the study that's, that started the field of epidemiology, as far as I'm aware, is the John Snow study during the 
1854 epi cholera epidemic in London, uh, where he conducted a, a study of mortality in streets covered by um, water pipes, which had been provided by different water companies, some of whom, some of those water companies were inadvertently um, providing households with, with, with sewage contaminated water. Um, but there is um, there there is a as another study in the nineteen uh, of of a slum upgrading in the nineteen twenties. Uh, McGonagall and Kirby. So McGonagall surveyed households in Stockton and on Tees, which is a town in northern England, um, and measured uh, effects on nutrition. So I'm I'm kind of um, showing these these cases here um, uh, for I suppose there's there's one um, the that there's something that that's important which differentiates these types of of studies um and 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 what is important is is how the assignment happened so in the in the case of 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 the snow study households basically self selected into or households landlords self selected into um in into the the water provider in the case of McGonagall, on the other hand groups were placed by um program planners and so some some uh, uh, and and that was that was that assignment was made would, was made based on a a, a decision, decision which which demarcated by a street in Stockton on Tees. Um, so so it, it's really important this this distinction. It's something that when we were looking at non-randomized studies, we it, it's a really it, this distinction between how the assignment was made. It's something really important to consider when. To consider when we're assessing, uh, when we're critically appraising them, and, and I think it, it, it's worth pointing out that studies that claim to resolve this, the issue of self-selection using adjusted analysis, are, are likely to be seriously um, mi misleading. And you actually you, you need an approach, a design-based approach, which can which can address confounding um, by self-selection. So here's a, some more recent examples. Um, I, I noticed that um, a, the, a, a recent um, st studies by the public health group um, um, and other groups in Cochrane um, are incorporating interrupted time series. So, so how is an interrupted time series uh, resolve a, an issue that I talked about earlier? Well, here's a case where we have just uh, implementation in a single village. This is a village in India, so there's there's no control group, uh, but the outcome is, um, is measured, which is monthly diarrhea cases um, in uh, reported to health facilities, um, which are reported over time, over a period of time, both uh, a period of 12 months, both before and after the water connect, the villages were simultaneously connected to the um, water supply. Um, it, it's where this this is a particularly um, interesting case because the, the data were found accidentally. In, in fact, they've been collected as through routine administrative reports um, and were found in the back of a locked filing cabinet by the study authors. And, and we, we find that uh, in cases um, where administrative data can, can be very useful. I mean, it's also worth pointing out that there is some um, some internal replication study evidence on interrupted time series um, that suggests that we're really looking for six six periods or more before or after in order for a valid um, time series to be established. Here's a second and unrelated example of a of a difference study, as I've called it. Uh, sometimes they're called difference in differences or double difference studies. Um, this is a case where in it, of a uh, privatization of the water supply in um, Argentina, um, where the um, the privatization in, happened after 1995, um, and they estimated the impacts on um, mortality, estimating around a 10% 10, 10 reduction in, in, in deaths amongst children. Um, the, the theory, there is a, a statistical theory behind double different studies, which is that it can account for an observable confounding, provided that units are, are, are measured at the household or individual level. Um, and some sources of confounding, it, uh, which at the time, those factors which are fixed over time, are, end up being differenced out through the, the calculations. 
Um, uh, and, but it's important that in order to verify that, that secular trends are, are perceived to be, are shown to be equal, as you can see in this figure, that the, 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 there's a, a equal trends in, in um, and equal levels, in fact, in, in the um, values, baseline values of the outcome for the five years before the intervention. Um, something else that, um, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of, is the discontinuity design. Um, in this case, this is a study of, um, of a Huai uh, River policy, which, which was implemented in the 1950s. So it's a study that showed a very long-term effect of, of, of poor air uh, exposure to, to bad air um, on, on um, uh, life. On, um, and what they found was a uh, reduced life expectancy um, of around, th uh, on average, three years because of um, air, air pollution, and the, uh, that was that was found found to be car um, cardiorespiratory um, um, causes of, of mortality. So um, we know that there is a um, we're likely to face a very broad range of designs, and as Eva said. Um, both interventions and uh, health and um, social outcomes. So, what's what's a good way to, um, to to start when you're considering how to to tackle a public health review? So, Eva's presented it. Um, Ashrita is going to be talking uh, talking about them a bit later. The 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 answer is we I believe the the evidence map. Um, so, an evidence map. Um, um, this this is an example of a map that we did for WASH. It, it actually came out. It's hot off the press. It came out this week in Campbell Systematic Reviews. Um, and what when we, we this is an evidence map of water sanitation and hygiene interventions. Um, and we identified that uh, there were very few um, syntheses which have been done on mortality, despite mortality being the main the main component of WASH related global burden of disease. Um, so we conducted a review of wash and, and mortality, and th this is the main. Um, our, our, th this this the map provided us with most of the primary studies on, on which we ultimately went on to synthesize. Um, I mean, it's, th th there's it's important to be careful about what we are actually measuring, um, and to defining the research question as 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 Eva also um, indicated um, so that so that we can be sure about the how direct the evidence is that we're, we're assessing um, and, and we've we've noticed that PICOs are often um, not not specifies specified as precisely as as we would want um, so um, Turning to this this review of mortality that we've we're, we're currently working on and uh, uh, we're hoping to publish soon, um, we we incorporated both in, in intervention and exposure studies. But it's important to differentiate those two studies. Why is that? Because we would usually expect um, effect sizes to to be different for exposures versus intervention studies because of Howard White's concept of the um, funnel of attrition. Um, where wherein impacts get smaller the further along the causal pathway you go. Um, what we were surprised to find in in this case that so this shows a forest plot of of um, the the wash intervention and exposure pooled effects. Um, and what uh, looking at diarrhea and mortality um, in childhood, as I as I said, um, we don't actually see differences in effects for these two types of of studies. Um, uh, which we were, as I said, we were surprised about. Um, this may be partly because of the um, the reasons for bias in reported outcomes are are less applicable for reported mortality than they are for other types of reported health outcomes, and that's from meta epidemiological evidence from um, Leslie Wood and uh, Yelena uh, Savovich. Um, Finally, what um, this this slide is here is really to 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 bring out the importance of of why we do conduct risk of bias assessment. 
Um, so this is a uh, also a forthcoming evidence from uh, meta epidemiolo epi epidemiological evidence um, from from bias in, in non randomized studies of inventions from from twenty um, Campbell Collaboration International Development Group reviews, uh, m many of which um, are, are relevant for public health. Uh, they also include um, international uh, development um, interventions. Um, and what this, this um, the non-randomized studies uh, that, uh, that were incorporated included the types of, of designs that I talked about above. Um, and um, each um, underlying systematic review and meta-analysis used um, a risk of bias tool, which we developed to um, critically appraise the studies and reported subgroup effects for um, randomized trials and then non-randomized studies of different um, degrees of, of predicted bias. And the what the um, meta-epidemiology, meta-epidemiological evidence that does is compare the predicted bias or um, with the deviations from the RCT benchmarks. And what we find is that um, bias is really important. Um, so it's it, so it's a really important component of of, um, of systematic reviews on on public health topics, um, but, but, and particularly the 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 port, the um, designs that are subject to very high predicted risk of bias. We also see that uh, we see much much we see very different effects from what we would expect from RCTs. Um, so that's the um, the end of the presentation. I, I I just wanted to flag that there's there's some ongoing work with um pub, with the that's being led by the public health group, which we're contributing to, which is on um, preferred and accepted risk of bias tools for us for assessing bias and non-randomized studies of intervention. So so look out for that in the next few months. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Hugh. Um, we're running a little bit over time and there's no questions in the chat, but um, I thought I might just ask one particular question and this is particularly around um, interrupted time series and a point that you brought up about uh, the particular example you showed where it was based on administrative data. Um, one of the issues that I think is probably um, a difficult reality with uh, designs like interrupted time series is that the issue of kind of uh, publication and reporting bias uh, may be much greater than um, what we observe with clinical trials. And with clinical trials, because we have registries, we have a way to kind of investigate that. But with interrupted time series analyses are often um, obviously undertaken with administrative data. If they don't show important findings, then I suspect that often they're not published. Did you have any comment to make about that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a, it's a really good point. And of, of course, when, when we're doing the um, critical appraisals, the cri critical appraisal tools do pick up on the um, the issue of likelihood of reporting bias. One of the, the ways in which that can be assessed is, of course, by as assessing for looking for the existence of a um, a pre analysis plan or a a, um, a study protocol. Um, it's worth pointing out that there's a lot more scope for pre-registering study protocols for non-randomized studies, including those retrospective studies based on administrative data sets than is currently being taken. So if you look at, for example, clinicaltrials.gov, um, I think there's something like 70,000, is it possible? No, maybe. Anyway, there, there's several thousand non-randomized studies on it measure, um, registered at clinicaltrials.gov, and so there's there's a lot to be said for um, for pre-registration, and and I think that in our it, you know that that's something that we can be promoting in our reviews work through our cr critical appraisals, and that we're we're sending the message that these studies should be should be pre-registered as far pre-registered 